Until we are all free, none of us are free. Emma Lazarus. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahaska here. And today, we'll look at some of the major effects of industry during the Gilded Age. The late 1800s witnessed incredible economic growth, spearheaded by a small collection of business moguls who amassed staggering fortunes. But contrary to rumors that circulated in Europe, America's streets weren't all paved in gold. The reality of American life was changing fast, and not always in a good way. Today, we'll look at a few ramifications of those changes. But first, let's ask a big question. Is America the land of opportunity? In 1883, American poet Emma Lazarus penned her most famous work, The New Colossus, a poem inspired by the Statue of Liberty. In it, Lazarus refers to the national symbol as a mother of exiles, from whose beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, and who says to the people of the world, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. In 1903, the new Colossus was commemorated on a plaque at the base of the statue that inspired its creation. Lazarus captured in 14 lines what Americans have long believed, that theirs is a country of welcoming and opportunity, that theirs is a nation that is strengthened by the diversity and hardiness of the immigrants and descendants of immigrants that founded, inherited, and adopted the United States. Today's lecture will focus a great deal on immigration during the same Gilded Age in which Emma Lazarus lived, and will put her words to the test. Our big ideas today will outline the major effects of the Gilded Age. Here's the first. The industrial boom of the Gilded Age brought on the rise of the modern American city. So this one's pretty straightforward. The Gilded Age made New York, New York. It made Chicago, Chicago. The rapid industrial expansion brought major economic activity to cities, and with it, economic opportunity. As Western farms became increasingly volatile, homesteaders returned to urban areas for the relative stability of factory work. Immigrants who lacked the skills or the means to start farms of their own also settled in cities. Between 1860 and 1900, populations in New York, Boston, Cincinnati, and St. Louis increased by 300%. Chicago underwent an incredible 15-fold increase during the same time frame. By 1900, 40% of all Americans lived in cities. By 1920, city dwellers outnumbered their rural neighbors for the first time. Improving steel technology gave rise to the first skyscrapers, and public transportation systems emerged to meet the bustling needs of the modern city dwellers. Cities also offered more accessible leisure and entertainment options than ever before, with new bars, restaurants, and theaters catering to a variety of socioeconomic classes. But along with the excitement of the modern American city, there were also problems. The demand for housing outpaced its supply. Builders struggled to keep up, and as a result, the quality of their work suffered. Building codes were few and far between, so builders rushed to finish one job so they could move on to the next. The worst results of this were low-income apartment buildings called tenements. Many cheaply constructed tenements were structurally unsound and dangerous fire hazards but they were soon filled with hundreds of residents just the same. The rapid growth of industrial cities also meant that most of them were poorly planned, and sanitation was a constant problem. But the cities of the Gilded Age were also hubs for cultural diversity. This is our second big idea. The Gilded Age attracted new immigrants to U.S. cities, mainly from Southern and Eastern Europe. Now, there were two major waves of immigration during the 19th century. The first took place between the 1820s and 1840s, before the Civil War. These immigrants were known as the Old Immigrants. 
They came mainly from English-speaking Western European nations like England, Ireland, and Germany. Most were Protestant Christians and shared some type of cultural background with natural-born white Americans. The immigrants of the Gilded Age, however, were dubbed New Immigrants. This second wave of immigration began in the decades following the Civil War, and the newcomers came largely from Southern and Eastern Europe, places like Italy, Russia, Poland, and the Balkans. Most new immigrants did not speak English and were not Protestants. They were Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Christian, or Jewish. They came to the United States largely in search of economic opportunity in the booming industrial economy, but they also came to escape famine, war, and religious persecution in Europe. Almost all European immigrants entered the country through Ellis Island, New York, where they were subject to an interview and medical exam. Chinese immigrants during the 1860s and 70s followed a similar protocol at Angel Island near San Francisco. During the Gilded Age, there was no such thing as legal or illegal immigration. If you survived the trip and you didn't have a cough or pink eye when you arrived, you were free to start your quest for the American dream. Of course, most new immigrants knew no one in America, and their first priority upon arriving was to find housing. New immigrants tended to settle in pockets of cities with other people from their home country. These pockets are known as enclaves. Major cities featured Italian neighborhoods, Polish neighborhoods, Chinese neighborhoods, and so on. Enclaves proved to have both positive and negative effects for immigrants. On one hand, immigrants were drawn to enclaves because they provided a sense of community and a space to preserve their language and culture. On the other hand, this form of self-segregation kept them living as outsiders in the eyes of many Americans, and it slowed the process of assimilation into mainstream American culture. Most immigrants had been farmers in the old country, but had neither the desire nor the means to continue the practice in the United States. And since few had technical skills or formal education, most were relegated to factory work. Immigrants flooded the labor market, driving factory wages down. This is our third big idea. The Gilded Age resulted in a widening wealth gap between the rich and the poor, and urban poverty was rampant. We discussed last time the incredible wealth that was amassed by Carnegie, Rockefeller, and the like. Savvy entrepreneurs took full advantage of the conditions the Gilded Age offered and turned incredible fortunes in the process. But their empires were largely built through the exploitation of a labor surplus that included immigrant and natural-born workers alike. Since factory work required little skill, anyone could be trained to fill most positions. And since many people moving into the cities were desperate for work, they were willing to accept terrible wages, working conditions, and treatment. Workers were expendable and replaceable. There were few breaks, no vacations or sick leave, no insurance for on-the-job injuries, and no workplace safety standards. The wages were insufficient to live on and forced workers into brutal housing arrangements. Hastily constructed tenement buildings lacked running water or sanitation facilities. They were often structurally unsound and presented serious fire hazards. Often, six to ten people would share a single room tenement, which offered little more than a place to get out of the cold weather between shifts at the factory. Another feature of this wealth gap was child labor. Child labor was part of a vicious cycle of Gilded Age poverty. Because the government did not ban or regulate child labor, children were part of the available workforce, driving wages even lower. And because wages were so low, poor families had little choice but to send their children to work in order to make ends meet. This cycle was nearly impossible to break, since kids working in factories did so in place of going to school, where they might have learned skills that would have allowed them to escape poverty. Put gently, poverty in the Gilded Age was at the root of a lot of unhappiness, and many Americans looked for something or someone to blame. This is our fourth big idea. The Gilded Age witnessed a rise in nativism, 
and support for anti-immigration legislation mounted. Now, nativism, or anti-immigrant sentiments, was hardly a new development in the Gilded Age. Nativism had originated in the 1830s and 40s with the Know Nothing Party, a political organization that opposed immigrants, mostly Catholics from Ireland. But nativist sentiments in the Gilded Age intensified for a variety of reasons. First, there was economically motivated nativism. Some Americans recognized that new immigrants were flooding the labor market and accepting factory jobs for menial wages. Immigrants were thus accused of stealing jobs from, quote, real Americans, and ostracized as the root cause of poverty in cities. Second, there was socially motivated nativism. Remember, the new immigrants were culturally and linguistically different from the average natural-born American in the late 1800s. Their settlement in enclaves within cities also slowed their assimilation, which opened them to prejudicial attacks and discrimination. And third, there was an acute yet misunderstood biological element of nativism in the 1800s. Because immigrants were among the poorest groups of people during the Gilded Age, they suffered in some of the worst living conditions. The overcrowded tenements and lack of sanitation caused diseases to spread more rapidly through immigrant communities, leading some to believe erroneously that Italians, Poles, Jews, and Slavs were members of biologically inferior races, races that were more susceptible to disease and inherently less clean. This incorrect belief fueled further bigotry against immigrants. But of all the hardship that European immigrants endured at the hands of nativists, Chinese immigrants got the worst of it. Most Chinese immigrants were relegated to working on railroads, an employer of last resort for most Americans. The Chinese were also targets of the first anti-immigration law of the modern era, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Passed in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act closed the United States to all further immigration from China. It also outlawed Chinese citizenship and accordingly the elective franchise. The Exclusion Act was renewed by Congress in 1892 and made permanent 10 years after that. It was not repealed until 1943. Now, while some blamed immigrants for their low wages and poor conditions, others took their issues directly to their employers. This is our fifth big idea. The poor wages and working conditions of the Gilded Age inspired early attempts to form labor unions. However, most were unsuccessful. The late 1800s witnessed the very first attempts at collective bargaining through labor unions. The idea behind collective bargaining is to leverage an entire workforce in negotiations for better wages and working conditions. A single factory worker during the Gilded Age was easily replaceable, but if all factory employees threatened to quit or strike, employers would be forced to listen, since replacing an entire factory's workforce would take time and cost the firm money. A number of nationwide labor unions were formed to try to collectively bargain with large corporations. Noteworthy examples include the National Labor Union, the Knights of Labor, and the American Federation of Labor. However, these organizations claimed only minor victories. The National Labor Union managed to secure the eight-hour workday, but only for employees of the federal government. The American Federation of Labor did eventually turn into an effective union, but not until the first decades of the 1900s. So why weren't these early efforts to unionize more successful? A couple of reasons. First, Federal and state governments, operating as they were under the thumb of big business owners, favored those owners in labor disputes. Three examples explain. In 1877, a strike on the Baltimore and Ohio railroads quickly spread across multiple industries and across state lines. But President Rutherford B. Hayes deployed the U.S. Army to end the protests and force the strikers back to work. In 1892, another strike turned violent at Andrew Carnegie's Homestead Steel Plant near Pittsburgh. In each case, federal or state troops were ordered in to end Union protests. 
A similar result occurred in 1894 when President Grover Cleveland deployed the army to end the Pullman Railroad strike in Chicago. The leader of the Pullman strike, Eugene Debs, was also arrested and jailed by federal officials after he refused a court order to end the strike. In addition to the federal courts, which often ruled against unions in disputes, organized labor also suffered in the court of public opinion. In 1886, at a Knights of Labor protest at Haymarket Square in Chicago, a bomb was detonated that killed seven police officers. While it's now believed that the assailants were not union members, but radical anarchists seizing an opportunity, the tragedy soured labor unions in the minds of many Americans. From then on, organized labor had to fight not only the oppressive business owners, but also the perception that their organizations were radical and violent. While labor unions could claim few tangible victories during the Gilded Age, historians do acknowledge that the episodic strikes and violence may have persuaded business leaders to take less hostile approaches towards organized labor. Peace was generally a better business practice. And the establishment of labor unions in the 1800s did clear the way for more substantial progress after the turn of the century. The last major effect of the Gilded Age is corruption outlined in our final big idea. The wealth gap of the Gilded Age gave rise to massive corruption at national, state, and local levels. If there's one overarching characteristic of politics during the Gilded Age, it's corruption. We discussed last time the influence that the titans of industry exercised over Washington, but corruption affected nearly every level of government. The most noteworthy corruption scandal of the Gilded Age was the Credit Mobilier Scheme, uncovered in 1872. Because railroads received massive subsidies from the federal government, corruption was most rampant in that industry. Between 1864 and 1867, the Union Pacific Railroad Company overcharged the government for railroad construction costs through a shell company of their own creation called Credit Mobilier of America. To prevent congressional investigation into the scam, they bribed influential members of Congress by offering them shares of the fraudulent construction company. The congressmen took the kickbacks and profited, along with Union Pacific, at the expense of the American people. But corruption wasn't limited to the railroads. Other instances of similarly corrupt deals were widely suspected. In 1886, only a few years after his presidency ended, Rutherford B. Hayes wrote in his diary, This is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people no longer. It is a government by the corporations, of the corporations, and for the corporations. And corruption was perhaps even more rampant at the local level. Illegal organizations known as political machines traded favors for votes in local elections. Then, they used their influence to force mayors and city councils to make decisions that sustained the machine at the expense of the taxpayer. The most famous of these organized crime rings, Tammany Hall, controlled New York City and state politics from the 1880s until the 1960s. Corruption during the Gilded Age lined the pockets of business owners and politicians and defrauded the American taxpayer of millions of dollars. It contributed to the wealth gap and the power gap between the average American and the titans of the Industrial Age. Whew. Okay, so that's quite a laundry list of nasty effects of the Gilded Age. So let's revisit Emma Lazarus and the idea of America as the land of opportunity. Did the words of the new Colossus ring true during the Gilded Age? Do they ring true today? It sure doesn't seem that way. Immigrants were freer to come to the United States in the 1800s, but it's hard to argue they were welcomed, as the poem suggests. They were largely without support. They faced prejudice and discrimination. They were forced to accept brutal factory work for demeaning wages, and they were further victimized by the corruption of Gilded Age politics. And while it would be nice to think that we've made progress in the 150 years since new immigrants of the Gilded Age faced 
such hardship, hopeful immigrants to the United States still face uphill climbs. Immigration laws, for example, are far more restrictive now than they ever were during the Gilded Age. It's much more difficult to access the opportunity that this country provides. And the nativist rhetoric of the 1800s still has its echoes in today's political discourse. On the other hand, immigrants to this country have found success and contributed mightily to our history. Alexander Hamilton was an immigrant. Andrew Carnegie was an immigrant. So was author and editor Joseph Pulitzer. You've probably heard of his prizes. Novelist Ayn Rand immigrated from Russia in 1917, and Albert Einstein from Germany during World War II. And I would be remiss not to mention the late Alex Trebek, of Canadian origin, who became a dual citizen in 1998. But even if these examples are the exception rather than the rule, even if Lazarus's words didn't ring true when they were written, even if they still don't ring true today, perhaps they will tomorrow or someday soon. Next time, we'll look deeper at the wealth gap of the Gilded Age and see if we can find a solution that we might apply to our current economic woes. See you then.